Dear brethren, brethren, I'm sure that each one of you are familiar with the sports of uh, biathlon and triathlon, where there are two sporting events either competed by cycling uh, or by running and swimming as well. But did you know that there is an Olympic sport called a pentathlon, derived from Greek meaning uh, penta, which is the word five, and athlon meaning competition. So comprising of five events consisting of fencing, freestyle swimming, equestrian show jumping, pistol shooting, and cross-country running. The sport was inspired by the traditional uh, pent pentathlon used during the Olympics, first documented in AD 708. The original five events held over one day started with the long jump, then javelin throwing, discus throwing, followed by the stadium, which was a short foot race and then followed by wrestling. Pent athletes were considered to be, to be amongst the most skilled athletes, and their training was often part of military service. As each of the five events in a pentathlon was, fought, was thought to be useful in war or in battle, the wide variety of skills needed to compete meant that pent athletes were held in high esteem as physical specimens of elite athletes. This is a sport for the select few. Only people are blessed with physical ability and ca athletic capability to compete in this type of sport can compete. Therefore, considering the multi-skilled sport of uh, pentathlon, I will have no hope in competing. What about you? In which events would you think you'll be able to compete, if any? I would therefore be hard-pressed this morning to encourage any of you to partake in a pentathlon, myself included. But I can now ever encourage you this morning on how you live out your Christian life. As much as being a pentathlete requires gifted ability, work and discipline of the body, and much training, the same can be attributed to the Christian life. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9... The Apostle Paul ascribes much of our Christian walk to running the race of life with nothing less than Olympic passion and perseverance. The running and the fighting of the Christian, Christian life is a running and fighting for eternal life and entrance into heaven. For that is our prize. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. But... It is a race and a fight in the confidence that we have been taken hold of by Christ. As much as there are multiple events that the pent athlete must excel in, there are multiple virtues in the Christian life that a Christian should pursue to live a godly life. And this morning, we will consider some of these virtues categorizing a Christian life that we should pursue as it will lead us to having sure and true confidence in a doubtful world. And this would be our title this morning, Sure and True Confidence in a Doubtful World. Being confident in, in, in His power that is, has equipped us with all the, necessary, or all the qualities necessary to be fully equipped for godly living. As we will see in our text, we are about to read. And our text this morning would be, the second epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verses, verses 3 to 11. I repeat, Second Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. But as you turn to your text, here with some, here with some background uh, to Peter's second epistle. The apostle Peter wrote the letter in about 65 AD. Peter, one of the twelve, and brother to Andrew, was a fisherman by trade. He wrote to believers to warn them of heretical teachers who were infiltrating the assemblies. But he also wanted to exhort the believers to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is evident that Peter found it necessary to catch the attention of his audience in the start of his second epistle. Apologies, I've just lost my.
He wanted to catch the attention of his, the audience because he, dive into, he dives straight into what some commentators regarded as a miniature opening sermon, a sermon from verses 3 to 11, which is our main text this morning. In this passage, Peter exhorting the believers to grow in Christian virtues because of the gift of faith that they have received. And as they experience growth in these virtues, they can be assured of their salvation, to have sure in, and true confidence in a doubtful world. We will, however, start reading from verse 1. Let us read 2 Peter 1, verses 1 to 11. Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure, for in doing these things you will never stumble. For in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. This is the reading of God's holy and all-sufficient word. Let us pray. Dear Father, our God, we come to you this morning expectantly to hear your word. May you speak to our hearts this morning. May it bring change within us according to your will. Bless us, strengthen us as we now consider your word. Please be with me as I deliver your holy word. Still us in your presence. Open our hearts and teach us from your word how you want us to live. For the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. As we have just read, if you are a true believer, you have all of Christ the moment you are born again. And you have all the resources and the power of Christ in your life to live a life of, of godliness. Thus, unlike the fact that only very few people are endowed the ability to compete in a pentathlon, every Christian, upon conversion has already supernaturally been endowed with the ability to grow in Christ's and Christian virtues and in order to live godly lives. Did you hear that, Christian? You've already been given the ability through Christ to run your Christian race. So there can be no excuse on our part not to bear fruit in pursuing virt virtuous living as we, have, as, as we have been more than adequately supplied with everything that we need to live a life of godliness the moment we have been converted. Have you noted how the word knowledge seems to be highlighted right from the onset in this passage? It is evident that Peter emphasizes the need for Christians to grow in their knowledge of Christ. But why is this important? Because knowledge of God enables us to grow in sanctification by God's divine provision. Growth in sanctification will be evidenced by our pursuit of virtuous living. The race of life has eternal consequences, not because we are saved by works, but because Christ has saved us from dead works to serve the living and the true God with Olympic passion. 
we see that God has given Christians all that they need to become spiritually mature. If they expect to, to uh, uh, but Christians must pursue spiritual maturity if they expect to be welcomed into God's eternal kingdom. We are called to be diligent, making our calling and election sure, so that we can know we will obtain the promised benefit. And I can tell you this morning that you can, because you are sustained by God's divine provision. As mentioned, our title is Sure and True Confidence in a Doubtful World. Thus, being confident in His power that has equipped us with all the necessary qualities to live a godly life through which we can be confident of our salvation without a doubt. The text forms three central sections exhorting believers to live godly lives and ultimately strengthening a believer's faith with assurance of salvation. First, we're looking at verse 3 to verse 4, which is sustained by God's divine provision. Then secondly, pursuing virtuous living, which we'll see in verses 5 to 9. And then thirdly, obtaining the promised benefit, we will see in verses 10 and 11. I will repeat. First, verses 3 to 4, sustained by God's divine provision. Here Peter builds on this connection between knowledge, the knowledge of God and the power of grace, enabling us to live godly lives. Secondly, in verses 5 through 9, pursuing virtuous living. Here we will consider the, the virtues to pursue in order to live godly lives. And then thirdly, and our final point, verses 10 and 11, obtaining the promised benefit. We will see that we need to strive to live godly lives, which will lead to a great reward. Now, starting off with our first point, we will, we will look and see how we are sustained by God's divine provision, verses 3 and 4. Let's consider what, what we have been granted. Please join me in reading verses 3 and 4 of Second Peter chapter 1. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So, we read to thus far. Verse 3 starts, Seeing that his divine power is granted to us, meaning whatever spiritual sufficiency believers have originates from his divine power. The Apostle Paul is, expresses it this way in Ephesians 2 verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or understand according to the power that works within us. This power that operates in the believers is the same divine nature as that which resurrected Christ. Remember that Peter himself had been an eyewitness to Christ's divine power. And it is this power alone that enables believers to do works that please and glorify God and accomplish spiritual things they cannot even imagine, as we've just read in Ephesians 3 verse 20. And as I previously mentioned, God permanently bestows his power on believers from the moment that they come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply put, God actually moves into our lives and lives within us through his Holy Spirit. And he brings his power to enable us to live the Christian life. Therefore, it is through his power that Christians have received anything, but everything pertaining to life and godliness, as we have read in the latter part of verse 3. We don't have to wait for any future action by our Lord. If you are a true believer, you have all of Christ the moment you are born again, as I've said. And you have all the resources and the power of Christ in your life to live a life of godliness so that there can be no excuse on our part as we've been more than adequately supplied with everything that we need the moment we are converted. So what have we received? the God-given ability to live godly lives. The reference in, uh, to life in the text is a reference to eternal life. Godliness will always accompany eternal life. The way we live our lives 
will, will be evidence of godliness, as Jesus said in Matthew 7. Every good tree will bear good fruit thus. Godliness refers, refers to the behavior expected of Christians who have come to know the God of Scripture. It means piety, reverence for God and His Word. It begins with the heart and inner attitude, working its way out to our words and our actions. It affects the way you live your life. Believers should live in a godly way, even now. Do you realize that the moment you are saved, eternal life has begun? Think about it. Though perfection and godliness will not be ours until the day Christ returns, only those who are godly will experience eternal life. And hence it is fitting that Christ's divine power is the source of godliness. For only God can make people godly. But God has made this power available in a specific way. And that is through our knowledge of him who called us. As we see in verse 2, Knowledge refers to more than a superficial knowledge of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. This is not just head knowledge, but true knowledge that goes right down to the heart. It refers to an Im intimate and an informed relationship that is the product of regeneration, and it continues thereafter. Listen how John Piper succinctly explains. Peter cannot get past his second sentence without exposing one of the deepest convictions, namely that knowing God is the means by which his grace and peace become large and powerful in our lives. If you want to enjoy God's peace and be the aroma of his grace in the world, your knowledge of him has to grow. Grace is not a mere deposit. It is a power that leads to godliness and eternal life. And where knowledge of the glory and excellence of God languishes, grace does not flow. The channel from God's infinite reservoir of grace into and through our lives is knowledge of God. We do not study the scriptures for its own sake, but because through it comes the knowledge of God. And through that grace and peace are multiplied in your hearts, in the church and in the world. End quote. As believers... We need this power to live. We tend to only focus on salvation, but a huge part of, of but a huge part occurs after salvation. I will explain. Salvation is monogistic, meaning it is all of God. Done once, it is complete. But sanctification is synergistic. We have to contribute our part in striving to live godly lives. And it is an ongoing process. Personal saving knowledge of the Lord is the obvious beginning point for believers. And as with everything in the Christian life, it comes from Him who called them. The knowledge that leads to life and godliness is the knowledge of God's precious and magnificent promises. What are these promises? Well, Peter has not qualified them here in the text. But he was surely referring to all the divine promises given to God's own children as found in the Old and in the New Testaments. So we can take it from the fact that since Peter omitted to mention the promises, that his focus was not on the promises themselves, as he does not specifically mention them, but his focus here is rather on the benefits that results from them. And the benefits are that Christians become partakers of the divine nature, being God's nature, and they escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. You see, the lost sinner is decaying because of his corrupt nature, but the Christian can experience a dynamic life of godliness because he has God's divine nature within. For mankind is under the bondage of corruption, according to Romans 8.21. But the believer shares the freedom and the growth that is part of possessing the divine nature. Believer, you have all the ability to live a godly life in fullness. Therefore, strive to do so. And Peter's point is clear. Spiritual growth is not a matter that a Christian can treat lightly. It is a goal to which we need to give ourselves body and soul every day of our lives. Living a godly life 
is, only, is the only normal fruit-bearing life for the child of God. And before we move to our second point, just ponder on this. What an advantage we have. In earlier times, believers did not have a Bible to read. But we have. And we need to be in the Word, where we can soak in these precious and magnificent promises. And I want to exhort you this morning, get into God's Word, so that you can get to know Him and Jesus, His Son, for that is eternal life. We get to know Him by being in His Word, seeking out the promises. But let's consider what these promises could be. He said, He that believes in me shall live, the promise of life. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He said, because I live, too shall, uh, because I live, you too shall live also. And he promised us resurrection life. He promised us grace upon grace. He promised us the Holy Spirit. These promises are yours and these promises are mine. But unless we enter our day armed with one or two of these precious and magnificent promises, we will be utterly vulnerable to temptation. However, if we hold in our hearts the amazing things which God had promised us, now and in the life to come, His divine power will be present and we will escape corruption and be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. This power flowing through these promises produces godliness, which in turn produces good fruit. Thus, we are sustained by God's divine provision. To recap, in verses 3 and 4, we see that we are sustained by God's provision. Therefore, we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. That is, God, through Christ, granted believers a perfect and a complete salvation. Yet, paradoxically, from verse 5, he requires that they work it out by applying all diligence in pursuing virtuous living. Hence, we now consider our second point, pursuing virtuous living. In verses 5 to 9, we will see how we can obtain the certain salvation, we can, uh, obtain, can obtain certainty of salvation through this pursuit. In verses 5 to 9, Peter gives us that key point itself. Because of what Christ Christians have received, Christians need to pursue virtuous living. Simply means live godly lives. Please join me in reading verses five, uh, 5 to 9 of 2 Peter 1, chapter 1. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. And we read up to this point. Verse 5 starts with, now for this very reason also. And what reason would that be? Because we have everything in Christ, because his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, as we have read in verse 3. Where there is life, there must be growth. The new birth is not the end. It is the beginning. But just as an athlete needs to train in order to excel, spiritual growth is not automatic. It requires diligence and discipline on a Christian's part in cooperation with God. Listen to Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as... In my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with, with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Believers, we are therefore to make every effort or apply all diligence in working out 
that what was received in faith. For God has granted us faith and all the graces necessary to grow in the virtues that Peter has listed. A godly character does not emerge from mere passivity. As Luther says, they should prove their faith by their good works. Again, and please hear me correctly here, we are not saved by works, but our works are evidence that we are saved. We are saved by faith and faith alone. As referred to in verse 5, saving faith is the ground in which the fruit of Christian sanctification grows. But that faith battles the flesh and will not produce a firm sense of assurance unless saints pursue sanctification and seeing the evidence of good works. As James 2.18 states, Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Thus, We have to work at it. We now come to the section in our text where Peter lists the seven virtues. These are virtues in which growth would produce evidence of salvation. Peter uses a literary form in which we have a step-by-step chain that culminates into a climax. Like the steps in a staircase, seven virtues that must be added one to the other as we move upward in our pursuit of spiritual maturity. Though they are somewhat random, all of them are important, and they not necessarily need to be pursued in in any order. Like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22, these qualities grow out of a life and out of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. It is, not, it is not enough for the Christian to let go and let God, as though spiritual work is God's work alone. Therefore, Peter wrote, apply all diligence or make every effort. We must work with the Father. Not that true Christian virtues are not refined um, human qualities, but they are divine qualities that make a person more like Jesus Christ. Let's now consider these virtues to be pursued. Much like multiple disciplines that has to be mastered by the pentathlete. But this does not mean that there are only seven virtues to be pursued. As in the text, we will follow them one after the other. So stay with me. Our first virtue to consider is moral excellence. Viewed as the ability to excel in heroic, courageous deeds. Thus, being courageous in our stand for the Lord and not being conformed to the world. In other words, being set apart from the lure and the seduction from this world. Paul modeled the pursuit of such spiritual heroism in Philippians 3 when he said, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What he is saying is, I pursue Christ-likeness. Then he admitted I have not attained it, but I pursue it. The goal is to be like Christ. He is our model of moral excellence. Beloved, I encourage you, strive to pursue Christ-likeness. And as you stand on that, do not be satisfied, but press on to increase your knowledge, which is our second virtue. And as we discussed earlier as well, The word knowledge means correct insight and understanding. It is truth properly comprehended, truth properly understood, and truth properly applied. It is correct understanding of doctrine. This, of course, involves diligent study and pursuit of the truth in the word of God. Again, we are to be in his word constantly. Beloved, I encourage you, study it. Meditate on it daily. And as you stand on that, do not be satisfied. But be diligent to master self-control, our third virtue. Self-control, which literally means holding oneself in and the mastery of your passions. Paul in his letter often compared the Christian to the athlete who must exercise and discipline himself if he ever hopes to win the prize. Self-control, an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit that we've read in, that we read of in Galatians 5.23, enables believers to avoid falling prey to various temptations. 
but also in Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Thus, we need to be working hard at controlling our fleshly desires. Are you working to control your thoughts, your thought life, your attitudes, your actions? Beloved, I encourage you, strive towards it. And as you stand on that, don't be satisfied, but cultivate perseverance, our fourth virtue. Perseverance, which also means patience and endurance, is doing what is right, resisting temptations and enduring in the midst of trials and difficulties. The New Testament uses the word frequently to refer to remaining strong in hardship. Perseverance is not something that develops automatically. We must work at it. James 1 verses 2 to 8 gives us the right approach. We must expect trials to come. Because without trials we could never learn, we could never learn patience. Nobody enjoys trials. But we do enjoy the confidence we can have in the trials that God is at work causing everything to work together for our good and for his glory. Beloved, I encourage you, strive to persevere, to persevere when it is difficult. And in that, let your life be synonymous with godliness, which is our fifth virtue. As discussed previously, being practically aware of God in every area of your life. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 8, Godliness is profitable for all things or in all things. Believers, we are to worship God and love God and adore God with a life of reverence for God and devotion to His holy will. Take note, while God gives us the ability to become godly, it is our responsibility to use the power He has made available to us. So, beloved, I encourage you to work at becoming people who please God in every phase of your life. Therefore, strive to live obediently. And as you grow in that, strive to kindle your affection for other believers. Brotherly kindness, our sixth virtue, with the original Greek word meaning Philadelphia, meaning brotherly affection and friendship, Mutual sacrifice for each other. At the heart of godliness is loving each other. In fact, 1 John 4.20 puts it that way, that if you love God, you'll love each other. 1 John also says that if you say you love God and you don't love your brother, you are a liar. Because if you really love God, you will love your brother. Beloved, I encourage you to strive to excel in brotherly kindness. For in doing so, you will also grow right into our seventh and final virtue, which is love. Surely, it is not by chance that love, the crown of Christian virtues in 1 Corinthians 13, comes at the climax of Peter's staircase of Christian qualities. The supreme evidence that one is a believer is love. Love is a virtue that sums up all other virtues which is in 1 Corinthians 14. And it says, uh, apologies, it's Colossians 3.14, and it says, it is the perfect bond of unity. Anyone who loves will possess the other qualities Peter mentioned. But the kind of love spoken in 2 Peter 1.7 is agape love. And the kind of love that God shows towards lost sinners it is the love that is described in 1 Corinthians 13. Let us read this. If you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14, we'll read from verses, verses 4 to verse 7. I'll again be reading from the Legacy Standard Version. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous, does not brag. It is not puffed up. It does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own. Is not provoked, does not make, take into account a wrong suffered, 
He does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with every truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We read, to the, we read up to that point. When we have brotherly love, we love because of our likeness to others. But with the agape love, we love in spite of the differences that we have. Beloved, love is a virtue, not an emotion. Christians are not encouraged to feel warmly about each other. We are instructed to act lovingly toward one another. Therefore, again, as we are, as we are cheered on in a race, beloved, I encourage you, give all you have to grow in love. For love is not, the last, not only the last and the greatest of Christian virtue. It is also the glue that holds all of the rest together, the quality without which all others will be less than what they should be. But most of all, it is meaningless to have mastered all the other qualities if we have not love. And I'm referring to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. As we consider these virtues, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And because we have the divine nature, these qualities of character do exist within us. And we can therefore grow spiritually and develop in each of these and develop Christian character. But we do that by diligently working at looking for opportunities to grow in these virtues. For we must cultivate, we must cultivate them so that they can increase in our lives. Yet, it is through the power of God and the precious promises of God that this growth does take place. God wants us to be conformed to the image of His Son in Romans 8.29. The Holy Spirit within will produce that image if we but diligently cooperate with God and use the means that He has lavishly given us. Therefore, strive to grow in them. If the virtues listed in verses 5 to 7 are abundantly present in a believer's life and actually on the increase, verse 8 states, that reality will render him as neither spiritually useless nor unfruitful with respect to their knowledge of Christ. This is then how a believer can be certain that he is growing spiritually. But then the converse. As verse 9 affirm, uh, affirms, that those who lack godly virtues and are not abounding with them give no assurance that they are believers and can therefore not have certain confident assurance that they are saved. Peter also states in verse 9 that those who are not uh, practicing these virtues have forgotten their forgiveness of sins. In other words, they are not living as forgiven sinners. They are behaving like unconverted people. If members of the church are living immoral lives, they be witness, be witness that forgiveness of sins mean little or nothing to them. They are referred to as being blind and nearsighted, having forgotten their purification from their former sins. Believers who are not experiencing an increase in the virtues will forfeit assurance. They cannot, have, they cannot be certain if they have been truly saved because they will not see the increase of, vir of, of virtue and usefulness in their lives. But God certainly, wants, God certainly does not want His children miserable and doubting His gift of salvation. Instead, He desires and delights in their joy, in their joy and confidence. Assurance strength, strengthens the soul against temptations and trials. In summary of our second point, pursuing virtuous living, believers who have these virtues, virtues in, uh, uh, increasing will enjoy assurance because they will see the fruit and the fullness in their own lives. And they will see that they are in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. However, believers who do not pursue in these virtues will forfeit assurance, for they cannot be sure that they are truly saved. Therefore, strive to live godly. We are called to make our election sure, as we will see in verse 10, which brings us to our final point. Point three, obtaining the promised benefit. 
as we strive to live godly lives. Please join me in reading our final two verses, verses 10 and 11 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure, for in doing these things you will ne never stumble. For in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Here Peter picks up the basic exhortation back in verse 5, applying all diligence or make every effort. That effort is to, is to be directed towards making their calling and election sure. Striving for spiritual maturity is not an option in the Christian life. We find it easy to presume on God's grace by becoming satisfied with simply being saved. Many Christians begin slipping into an attitude expressed by the French skeptic Voltaire. God will forgive. That's his job. And Peter wants to sound a clear warning against this kind of spiritual slackness. Peter, as we have seen, focuses on the need of our own effort in becoming holy. And he says the same thing in 1 Peter 1 verses 14 and 16. As obedient children, not being conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your conduct, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And Peter is not alone in bringing in the human side of sanctification. The Apostle Paul also says in Romans 8, verses 12 to 13, So then, brothers, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the, the practices of the, uh, of the body, um, you will live. In other words, putting to death the practices of the body. That requires diligent work. All taught in Ephesians 4, to lay aside the old man and to put on the new man, which is the, in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. We have to understand that sanctification is a process where God, by His Spirit, makes us holy, and that it is we ourselves who have the job of becoming holy. Peter emphasizes human responsibility because he is confronting a situation where people are, be, be, are becoming danger of being lax lack, uh, in their holiness pretty much like today. But thankfully, the true, the true child of God has a precious helper. The indwelling Holy Spirit who teaches us, who leads us, convicts us, comforts us. In other words, He sanctifies us and He helps us to mature and grow in every area of our life where we are willing to submit to Him. We must learn how to not waste time on worthless distractions, but instead invest in growing in these Christian virtues. And to do this, we must be sure that we are Christians to begin with and remember that we have at our disposal the Holy Spirit to enable our growth. And the second point, we must use all our means at our disposal to cultivate the Spirit's power within our lives. And that is through Bible study, through prayer, through Christian worship and fellowship. Much like attending the equip class, which we have after the service, our midweek Bible studies, or, or joining our people of the word on Saturdays, where we have women of the word, men of the word, and children of the word. We must, and point three is, we must take responsibility to make our lives conform as best as we can to the godly image presented in Scripture. We know that we don't do it in our own power, but we, st we are still supposed to do it. There are many practical things we can do day in and day out to work at producing Christian virtues. And as you pursue and grow in these virtues, seeing that your life is full, useful and fruitful, as we see in verse 8, you will not stumble into doubt, despair, fearing, questioning, but enjoy assurance that you are saved. Saved into an everlasting life. For verse 11 says that those who continue in such godly qualities will enter 
into the eternal kingdom. And this, project, this prospect should bring joy to our hearts. An abundant entrance into eternal heaven is the hope and the reality for Christians who live faithful, fruitful lives here on earth. And that is what we can look for, forward to. That is our prize. Peter insisted that people cannot enter into it without living a godly way. But this is not salvation by works, but salvation with works. As long as Christians practice these things, increasingly pursue the moral virtues essential to holy living, they will give evidence to themselves and enjoy assurance that God has granted them eternal life. And so, in closing, the, the pent athlete, much like the world, will have self-confidence in their own abilities acquired through their own work. But for Christians, complete confidence comes directly from God. Being confident in His power that has equipped us through all, all the qualities necessary to achieve things which we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. For self-confidence is ordinary about having trust in one's own unique abilities and qualities. But for, Christian, for Christians, confidence is but more than this. It is a belief in His ability and the power that He has granted towards us, enabling us to live godly lives. But, but it is furthermore, as we see in Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this, that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What Philippians 1.6 reminds us is that we are not finished. We are not a finished product. But we can have great hope and great confidence in God's plan for our lives and who, will become, and who we will become when He has completed us. We know that we will not achieve perfection in this life. But, Peter, but Peter's point is that we need to be constantly on the way towards this goal, getting closer to it all the time. Dear Christian, as I said in the beginning, I can't encourage you to become a pent athlete, but I can encourage you to, to strive in growing, godly, in, in growing in godliness. For I can assure you, as we have seen in the text, you are able to do so. Yes, it is hard work, just as any athlete and some of those here can attest. Training is hard and not for the slothful. You start in increments to get fit. Athletes start running short distances, then gradually increase as they become more able. So you as well, hold, uh, as well, hold to these virtues before you. Choose one or two of them and start working at them, little by little. Soon you'll see you are excelling in them and then moving on to the next, all the while maintaining what you've grown in. Just like that, an athlete training for a multidisciplined sport, such as the uh, pentathlon. But beloved, if like any athlete you stumble on the track, take heart and keep your eye on the prize. For though we stumble and we fall, the Lord will lift you up. For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked will stumble in calamity. And we read that in Proverbs 24 verse 16. Therefore, Take heart and run with confidence, but run. It is, not a, it is not a profession of faith that guarantees salvation. It is our progression in the faith that gives us this assurance. There has to be evidence of a godly life before we can have assurance. For sinners to be put into, right, into the right relationship with the Holy God requires an act of redemption, an act that could could be accomplished only by one who was himself morally perfect. Christ lived a sinless, uh, sinless life and went to the cross in obedience to the Father. It was through this obedience that he was qualified to offer himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. And if you are here this morning and you have not confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord and believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you are not saved. And I, ask, and I ask you this morning to please speak to me or any one of the stewards. There will also be people in the prayer room to my right after the service, up the stairs. Do not delay. Seek him while he may be found. 
And when the Lord saves someone, that salvation is forever. It is irrevocable. You can therefore not lose your salvation. If you've been saved, you will be kept by God. He gives us faith that saves and a faith that endures to the end. Every believer will arrive in, in heaven. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you for the gift of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for these truths we have just considered in your word. Thank you for your precious and magnificent promises. Thank you for providing all we need in Christ. Please grant us understanding that we might enjoy the resources you have provided to the fullest and not think that we need something more. For we have received all we need in you to live a way that would glorify you. Give us true knowledge as we pursue and grow in these virtues with all our might so that we could live godly lives to your glory. And as we do that, make us fruitful that we might enjoy assurance, being confident that we are kept in you and that we will one day receive our inheritance in heaven. Thank you for this grace and this salvation. And in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.